My name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS, and I'm delighted to welcome you wherever you are in the world. It's morning in Washington, but wherever you are, we hope that you are dialing in and enjoying this remarkable opportunity that we have to have a conversation with the National Security Advisor from the United Kingdom. Uh, this is Sir Stephen Lovegrove. Um, a real privilege for us to be able to meet with him today. Honestly, there are probably 10 topics that would be timely for this conversation, but the topic we want to focus on today is nonproliferation. It's not a, it's not a theme that's prominent every day in policy circles, but it should be. Uh, these last six months have been somewhat startling. We've had uh, North Korea threatening to have a seventh launch or seventh detonation of their nuclear warheads. We have Iran declaring that they can make a nuclear bomb now. Uh, we've had Vladimir Putin has he said he put his f nuclear forces on alert. He didn't really do it, but he said he would. Uh, these, these are startling things in our world, and there's a framework for this to try to provide transparency and predictability. It's the Nonproliferation Treaty. And we're very fortunate that, uh, that National Security Advisor Lovegrove uh, focuses on this. It's one of his priorities. He's got about 15 of them. But this is one of them, and we're going to have an opportunity to learn his thinking today. And so we're very grateful in welcoming him to uh, Washington and to CSIS. Uh, Dr. Seth Jones is going to lead the conversation today, but I believe we're going to be, you'll start with an introduction. Seth will begin by formally introducing the National Security Advisor, and then we look forward to hearing his thoughts. Thank you. Stay tuned. Well, we have the, uh, the honor today of, of having with us, as Dr. Hamry mentioned, Sir Stephen Lovegrove, the UK National Security Advisor. Uh, he has a long and distinguished career, which I will not outline today, but it is on the website. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Stephen, for uh, coming to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, and thank you to Dr. John Hamry and Dr. Seth Jones and the Center for Strategic and International Studies for hosting us today. And thank you to all joining us here at CSIS uh, or virtually. I must begin by talking about the war in Ukraine. Uh, we have recently passed the grim milestone of 150 days since President Putin launched this unprovoked illegal war, bringing untold suffering to the innocent people of Ukraine. And I'm afraid the conflict fits a pattern of Russia acting deliberately and recklessly to undermine the global security architecture. That's a pattern that includes the illegal annexation of Crimea, the use of chemical and radiological weapons on UK soil, and the repeated violations that caused the collapse of the INF Treaty. And we will con continue to hold Russia to account for its destabilizing actions as an international community. What is happening in Ukraine is also a manifestation, though, of a much broader contest unfolding over the successor to the post-Cold War international order. And that context has profound implications. It will decide whether we live in a world in which regionally aggressive powers such as China and Russia can pursue might is right agendas unchecked or a world in which all states can ensure their sovereignty, competition does not spill over into conflict and we cooperate to protect the planet. As this contest unfolds, we are entering a new and dangerous age of proliferation in which new technological change is increasing the damage potential of many weapons and those weapon systems are more widely available. We need to start thinking about the new security order. Both the elements that have guaranteed strategic stability in the past, effective deterrence in all of its forms, combined with a renewal of a functional arms control framework, need urgent attention. Now, policymakers have been urged recently to learn to navigate the absence of order 
And that is in part good advice, but it is important to build some handrails to guide our thinking as we prepare to negotiate the complex landscape ahead. In the 1950s and 60s, policymakers faced similarly uncertain terrain. The advent of nuclear weapons had created a tension between strength and stability. Strength, having the speed, initiative and surprise to ensure security. And stability, there being nothing for either side to gain from striking first. And out of this period, academics and policymakers developed the concept of strategic stability, building on the work of Thomas Schelling, Herman Kahn and Samuel Huntington. In simple terms, strategic stability meant establishing a balance that minimised the risk of nuclear conflict. It recognised that an atmosphere of competitive armament generated the need for continuous dialogue. It was delivered through two core components, deterrence and arms control. In Madrid last month, NATO reaffirmed strategic stability as essential to our collective security. But we should be honest, strategic stability is at risk. During the Cold War, we thought in terms of escalation ladders, uh, thanks to Herman Kahn, largely predictable linear processes that could be monitored and responded to. Now we face much broader, a much broader range of strategic risks and pathways to escalation, driven by the developments of science and technology, including rapid technological advancement, the shift to hybrid warfare, and expanding competition in new domains such as space and cyber. And these are all exacerbated by Russia's repeated violations of its treaty commitments and the pace and scale with which China is expanding its nuclear and conventional arsenals and the disdain it has shown for engaging with any arms control agreements. Indeed, Rebecca Herzman and Heather Williams, former and current directors of the CSIS project on nuclear issues, have argued that we are now more likely to see escalation wormholes, sudden unpredictable failures in the fabric of deterrence causing rapid escalation to strategic conflict. Moreover, the Cold War's two monolithic blocks of the USSR and NATO, though not without alarming bumps, were able to reach a shared understanding of doctrine that is today absent. Doctrine is opaque in Moscow and at Beijing, let alone Pyongyang or Tehran. So the question is how we reset strategic stability for the new era, finding a balance amongst unprecedented complexity so there can be no collapse into uncontrolled conflict. The new NATO strategic concept sets the direction on which we must now build, and this will be difficult, but we have a moral and a pragmatic duty to try. The circle can only be squared if we renew both deterrence and arms control, taking a more expansive and integrated approach to both. In March last year, the UK published the Integrated Review, our broadest and deepest review of national security and international policy since the end of the Cold War. The Integrated Review's emphasis on integration was a deliberate response to the blurring of the boundaries between war and peace, prosperity and security, trade and development, and domestic and foreign policy. In both the US and the UK, we've already started moving to deeper integration in our approach to deterrence. From a UK perspective, integrated deterrence means bringing together all of the levers of state power, political, diplomatic, economic and military, to deliver effect. It means tailoring our responses, be they military, diplomatic or economic, to the specific context, taking into account our understanding of our adversary's motivations. Integrated deterrence also means working in a more joined up manner across government and society more broadly. It means working more closely with our allies and our partners through NATO, but also through new groupings such as AUKUS and strengthening our relationships with partners in the Euro-Atlantic, Indo-Pacific and around the world. And we must give due, arguably overdue, regard to improving and strengthening deterrence by denial. In an age of revanchiste uh, aggressive powers committed to the concept of spheres of influence, we must ensure that the vulnerable have the ability to defend themselves, thereby deterring aggression in the first place. A central challenge, though, is to avoid this leading to inevitable proliferation. 
So the next step should be that we develop our thinking on integrated arms control, advancing a dynamic new agenda that is multi-domain, multi-capability, and draws together a much wider set of actors. Now, historically, arms control has consisted of a set of regimes imposing limits on specific capabilities alongside strategic stability dialogues focused on risk reduction. And much of the existing architecture remains vital, such as the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention and the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. That last, the NPT, has been the cornerstone of nuclear security and civil nuclear prosperity for the last 52 years, and the UK remains committed to its implementation in full. We will work with all state parties at the forthcoming review conference to strengthen the treaty as the irreplaceable foundation and framework for our common efforts. The reality, however, is that the current structures alone will not deliver what we need a modern arms control system to achieve. Many other long-standing agreements have fallen apart as a result of Russian violations, despite them offering the, co the conflict management, confidence building and transparency that Moscow claims to seek and that logic would dictate that it should desire. These include the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and Open Skies, all of which were designed to provide stability in the Euro-Atlantic area. Other proposals such as the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, simply do not address the obstacles that must be overcome to achieve lasting global disarmament. And many of the frameworks that are still in place were designed for a world that no longer exists. They offer patchy coverage and don't, offer, uh, don't cover all capabilities, including some dangerous new and emerging technologies. They often rely on a clear distinction between civilian and military use cases. They were largely designed for a bipolar context. They do not take fully into account the pace of technological development and information sharing, which can challenge the efficacy of the control lists. And they rely on an information environment that is increasingly susceptible to corruption and disinformation. Further integrated arms control will need to extend across several interlinked and overlapping categories of proliferation. First, we need to look at the increasingly large set of weapons where the barriers to entry and ownership are low and getting lower, such as cyber weapons, low-tech drones, small arms and light weapons, and chemical and biological capabilities. Now, these weapons alone may not change the strategic balance, though the jury is still out on cyber, but they will interact in unpredictable ways with broader strategic competition. Second, we need to look at the new weapon systems or technologies that only the most powerful states can develop and that threaten to upset the strategic balance. Again, cyber is a key capability in this category, alongside space-based systems, genetic weapons, nuclear-powered cruise missiles, directed energy weapons and hypersonic glide vehicles. We must also remain vigilant, as technological development means that some of this second category could, over time, shift into the first. For example, the International Institute for Strategic Studies has assessed that in 2001, only three states possessed dedicated land attack cruise missiles. Today, at least 23 countries and one non-state actor have access to these weapons. And that last point is important. Many non-state actors could, absent proper control, develop those capabilities. A third category, we must be eternally vigilant for traditional nuclear weapons being developed by rogue states, dangerous in its own right of course, but also potentially sparking a rush amongst regional neighbours to do the same. As the P5 uh, leaders agreed in January this year, and to use Presidents Reagan and Gorbachev's resonant phrase, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And a fourth category, we must acknowledge that existing nuclear states are investing in novel nuclear technologies and developing new war-fighting nuclear systems, which they are integrating into their military strategies and doctrines and into their political rhetoric to seek to coerce others. For example, we have clear concern about China's nuclear modernization program that will increase, increase both the number and the types of nuclear weapon systems in its arsenal. Now combined, this is a daunting prospect. Binding legal frameworks should remain our long-term goal. 
but there is no immediate prospect of all the major powers coming together to establish new agreements. So, as we agreed in the NATO strategic concept, our immediate focus should be getting on with the work of strategic risk reduction. Today, I propose four principles to guide our approach to integrated arms control. The first principle is that we should have a pragmatic focus on establishing and regulating behaviours. That does not rule out mean, uh, the possibility of new formal agreements to regulate capabilities. We should keep pursuing them when they are useful and achievable and look for opportunities to update existing ones, as the UK did in supporting the extension of New Start. But the breadth and complexity of the proliferation landscape means that there is no one-size-fits-all approach. We need to establish new norms for behaviour in the context of hybrid and tech-enabled conflict, setting red lines for the grey zone as it emerges as a new arena for strategic competition. It is more likely that we will be able to find initial common ground and mutual benefit by raising our thinking above tit-for-tat exchanges on individual systems or technologies. And we can take encouragement from, for example, the work our two countries have led in the UN to introduce a framework to reduce space threats through norms, rules and principles. And that has helped to galvanise a global discussion on what constitutes responsible space behaviour. And here I commend the US commitment earlier this year not to conduct destructive direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing. This behaviours and norms model is one that already has strong foundations for expansion. For example, the UK Attorney General spoke earlier this year about the importance of bringing non-intervention principles to life in the context of cyber. She proposed an international congress on the kinds of cyber behaviours that could be unlawful in peacetime, such as using cyber to disrupt supply chains for essential medicines or vaccines. The second principle is that we should widen the conversation. Strategic stability has historically been the business of major powers, but in the current context, strategic stability cannot be negotiated by this group alone. There remains a clear need for certain specific conversation between limited partners, but we need to make a far stronger case that building and maintaining stability is in every nation's interest and that there is a shared pool of responsibility. Future deliberations on arms control should, where appropriate, be global by design, extending not just to traditional allies and partners in Europe, but to a much wider group of countries. And we need to create a bigger tent, thinking beyond states, to industry experts, to companies, to technologists, who will play a critical role in understanding the risks and opportunities of dual use and other new technologies, and in setting the standards that govern them. The third principle is that we should start with dialogue. We must create and preserve space and channels for dialogue to build trust and counter disinformation. In time, this may lead towards our long-term aim of new or updated binding agreements, but there is a significant intrinsic value in dialogue itself. In the obligatory Churchill quotation, we want jaw jaw, not war war. During the Cold War, we benefited from a series of negotiations and dialogues that improved our understanding of Soviet doctrine and capabilities, and vice versa. This gave both of us a higher level of confidence that we would not miscalculate our way into nuclear war. Today, we do not have the same foundations with others who may threaten us in the future, and particularly with China. Here, the UK strongly supports President uh, Biden's proposed talks as, with China as an important step. Trust and transparency built through dialogue should also mean that we can be more active in calling out non-compliance and misbehaviour when we see it. At the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in August, we will stress the importance of Russia respecting its obligations under the NPT in both deed and word. And the final and fourth principle is that we should, own, we should take early action to renew and strengthen confidence-building measures. The goal of confidence building measures is to contribute to, reduce or even eliminate the causes of mistrust, fear, tension and hostility. They help one side interpret correctly the actions of the other in a pre-crisis situation through an exchange of reliable and interrupted, often private, information on each other's in, uh, intentions. Confidence and trust grow when states are open about their military capabilities and plans. That is why governments can report every year their national military spending to the UN, as well as their recent weapons transfers. And I'm afraid, is there any clearer example of the collapse of these mechanisms than the invasion of Ukraine? 
when I and others questioned the build-up of forces on the border, we were assured it's just an exercise. We didn't believe it and we were right not to do so. Nevertheless, we must try to get back to a point where reassurances like that are worth something. So we now need to re-energise the existing Euro-Atlantic architecture and extend the approach into new geographic regions. As we see, seek to strengthen confidence building measures, there is also a major opportunity to harness new technology and make better use of open source materials to improve our capabilities and capacity to identify, share and verify information. For example, the UK's recently published Defence AI strategy sets a clear ambition for artificial intelligence to play a key role in counter-proliferation and arms control, including for verification and enforcement. Again, confidence building is an area where I believe we should, as a global community, be able to make progress irrespective of wider political contexts. The indices of self-interest and mutual benefit are both clear to see. Let me be clear. This new agenda for arms control will be difficult to de deliver. We will need to take incremental steps, but we can and must make progress. History shows us that we can forge a path through uncertainty. After World War II, the world had no template for managing the atom bomb's destructive power, so we created new frameworks. It took years, but it was possible and it was done. And it was possible despite the advent of the Cold War. Indeed, some of the most significant breakthroughs in arms control, including both nuclear arms control and the advent of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, came when tensions between the West and the USSR were at their peak. Let me be clear, arms control frameworks open to abuse and violation, as they always have been, are only one side of the coin. Effective deterrence mechanisms and capabilities tailored to the current and developmental threats are indispensable. So let us not neglect either side of the coin, deterrence or arms control, and start on the foundations from which we can build a strategic stability in these perilous times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Stephen, for your comments. Uh, they come in an opportune time. As you note, uh, we have seen Vladimir Putin hint at the use possible use of nuclear weapons to defend uh, uh, Russian sovereignty. We've seen uh, the uh, hints of proliferation uh, with the Iranians. We've seen the North Koreans rattling. And as you highlighted in your talk, we've seen the continuing development of nuclear capabilities from the Chinese. You talked about Schelling, Herman Kahn, Sam Huntington in your, uh, in your talk, including issues related to strategic stability and arms control. But I wanted to hone in on the deterrence issue. How serious of a challenge right now is and will be deterrence on all of these issues? And how are you thinking about deterrence going uh, forward? So I think the um, first point um, I would make on that is, um, first of all, I deplore the rhetoric that um, Russia has been occasionally using, although it has to be said not backing up with um, uh, activity, operational activity on, on the ground. I deplore the rhetoric that um, Russia has been using around nuclear use um, and I commend very, very strongly the uh, restraint with which your president in particular has responded uh, to it. The second thing I would say is that um, there has never been a remote suggestion of um, uh, the West response to, and indeed the civilized world's response to, um, uh, the conflict in Ukraine being about the sovereignty of Russia. That is not in question. We have no um, remote um, uh, remote um, desires which anybody should be concerned about with respect to the sovereignty of Russia and indeed actually I do notice that um, Minister Lavrov in the last week or so suddenly brought into question the, um, whether or not uh, regime change should be occurring in Ukraine so the boot is very much on the other um, uh, foot there. Um, clearly that type of um, uh, rhetoric is designed uh, to intimidate. I think it is um, uh, extremely uh, reckless. The important um, 
uh, uh, response to it is to make sure that our communications are measured, predictable, and sensible, so that nobody can um, find themselves into uh, find themselves moving into a miscalculation position. But as I said in the talk, alongside that um, uh, restraint, there needs to be effective deterrence. We need to ensure that uh, we have um, capabilities which um, will, no matter what anybody says, deter them from uh, making very reckless moves um, in, that, in this regard. So I am um, a strong supporter of the recapitalization of um, the uh, defence enterprises um, and defence systems in a number of different countries around the world at the moment. I applaud um, the uh, commitments that have been made by Germany, by Japan, uh, the kinds of statements which are being made at the moment in the UK in the context of um, uh, the new Prime Minister uh, coming in and of course the continued um, immense contributions that uh, the United States makes to, um, makes to uh, world security. So sticking with this, with the uh, broader subject of uh, nuclear weapons, particularly non-proliferation, uh, the 10th Review Conference, or REVCON, uh, of the parties to the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT, will take place in August in New York. Can you talk about what are the UK's main priorities and objectives, including in the context of the UK's potential warhead stockpile increase, AUKUS, uh, uh, nuclear-powered submarines, what are the main priorities and objectives? Um, well, I'm going to disentangle some, <laughs> some of, those, um, some of those, those points there. I mean, our main objective um, is to have a conversation um, around non-proliferation in which um, potentially proliferating powers are actually genuinely and fully engaged in it. Um, we don't, um, we are not sort of kind of uh, misty eyed, naive optimists. I mean, most Revcons do not come up with a document which um, uh, everybody goes away um, and immediately puts into place, and it may well be that that is the case here, but we do need um, uh, Russia and Iran and we need everybody to start having a proper conversation along the lines that um, I've just been trying to outline in my remarks um, uh, earlier on. Uh, the, uh, the UK's announcement in our integrated review that we were um, increasing very marginally the size of our stockpile I think needs to be uh, taken in the context of a couple of things. One, we're absolutely committed to um, uh, the, um, the, the intention um, and the practice of Article 6 of the NPT. There's no doubt about that. We have the uh, smallest uh, nuclear stockpile of any uh, of the uh, uh, avowed uh, nuclear nations. We only have one delivery mechanism. However, uh, our policy has always been that we would have the minimal credible deterrence and after a great deal of work which we've been doing over the last couple of years before the integrated review we decided that the minimum credible deterrence required a very small increase in the stockpile numbers it's still way below sort of kind of everybody else's um, and we stick to that AUKUS is not a proliferation issue in my um, opinion and uh, that is the nature of the discussions that we're having with the IAEA at the moment as well. Um, Non-proliferation is obviously about weapon systems. Uh, AUKUS, um, I'm sure that everybody watching this or listening to this will know, is about the provision of a nuclear-powered submarine. Now, I am not saying that that is a um, insignificant thing. It isn't. I've described it in the past as being the most significant capability development in the last 60 years, and I, uh, I believe that a significant capability collaboration in the last 60 years, and I, I stick with that. But it is not about the proliferation of um, nuclear weapons. And indeed, the way in which we are discussing uh, the arrangements we'll put into place with the US and Australia gives us the opportunity to set a new and higher bar for um, how we deal with uh, nuclear materials in this particular um, context, which I welcome. 
So you mentioned in your uh, response to the question right now, the integrated review, it's a document we've read uh, consistently, published in 2029. Interesting, by the way, in the uh, national defense strategy and all of the U.S. Uh, uh, national security documents, the nuclear posture review, they will continue with this integrated deterrence role. So we're seeing the integrated term come up. Maybe we credit the British for uh, putting it out first. Uh, but since the publication of the integrated review, uh, there have obviously been a number of developments around the globe, including the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So how have these developments impacted uh, the priorities, even the implementation of the integrated review, if, if at all? Um, I had a look at the integrated review again a couple of weeks ago, actually, just to check that um, we were in, um, you know, whether or not we needed to make some adjustments. We did a slightly more formal review a, a couple of months ago, actually. I mean, it, what the integrated review said was that we are going to pursue um, British advantage through science and technology. It was going, we were going to play the fullest possible part in the reconfiguration of the international order which is going on at the moment. We were going to strengthen resilience both at home uh, and uh, abroad and that was a very broad definition of resilience and slightly, slightly prompted obviously by the COVID um, epidemic. And we were going to um, improve and invest in defence and security at both at home and abroad. And the things that were driving those um, policy prescriptions were r really two things. One was the, um, the, 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 the re-emergence and much more complicated re-emergence of state power, this great state competition. Um, and the impact of science and technology across the board. And I cannot see anything about those basic, um, uh, that basic sort of kind of skeleton that is wrong. What has changed is that um, we have seen the re-emergence of um, state um, created um, war on a very, significant scale in a timetable and at a level of intensity which we did not anticipate. So we are adjusting a, a bunch of things as a result of it, but the basic prescription I think is, is, is correct. There are some things I think that have been set in train by the war in Ukraine which we will need to deal with in slightly um, uh, slower time and definitely do have consequences. So the revitalization of the, um, a lot, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, political Western alliances is definitely part of that. NATO is clearly the primary example. The accession of Finland to Sweden is sort of kind of very um, important. Um, the acceleration of energy transition, I think, is another thing which is important that we need to think about. Um, uh, the, 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 the role, a uh, critical role, of non-aligned states, um, I think we n need to spend more time um, on. I think it has been uh, very impressive in the way in which the world has come together, but it is not, you know, there's more than one narrative out there and it's important that we pay attention to that rather than assume that, you know, just because we're saying something everybody will agree to it. That isn't the case. And I think the other thing that I, I, I think this was a long term, this was a, this was a long term trend that you could see anyway, but um, it's quite difficult not to see Russia and China getting more closely um, involved with each other, and by and large, that will be a, um, a, a Russia, I think, uncomfortably falling into a Chinese orbit. Um, it'll Russia at the moment will find it difficult to find investment from anywhere, probably, but China. Although I notice that China's not <laughs> investing in Russia either, um, it will find it difficult to find access for its goods and services and its energy, except through possibly Chinese. I so say there, there is going to be a, for Russians it is going to, I think, be uncomfortable to find themselves in that kind of relationship with China for the future. And I, I, I mean, last point, I think we need to be mindful that um, there is a potential sort of bifurcation um, 
seeming to emerge. Not, I mean, people have talked about the splinter net a lot and sort of the IT um, information sort of kind of environment being bifurcated. But I think you can you can begin to see some aspects of that in the financial system um, uh, developing. And you can also see potentially sort of different. I mean, not one single global energy market emerging as well. And these are significant things that in slightly slower time I think we're going to need to address and uh, try and deal with. I want to pick up on your comment about uh, uh, Russia-China relations. Uh, we, we, we've seen uh, some talk about an axis. Uh, I think as you, as you note, uh, there are going to be some challenges moving forward. Um, we've seen recently uh, the Iranians uh, talk about uh, providing unmanned aerial vehicles uh, to the Russians. Uh, I want to go back to the early post-World War II period. Um, the situation today is a little bit different, but we had uh, Sir Winston Churchill uh, in the U.S. in March of 1946, yep. who gave his Iron Curtain speech. Yep arguing that from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, the Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. The situation today is a bit different around the globe, um, but some have argued that we are starting to see a new Iron Curtain, perhaps both physical and digital in that sense, from the Finnish Russian border, um, potential new NATO member, through the Baltics, uh, down through Ukraine into the Middle East where we see strong, relatively strong Russian-Iranian relations in Syria, in Lebanon, um, in Iran itself, and then into, into the Indo-Pacific. So my question to you is, is how do you see competition along those lines? Do you, su do you see the, emer the emergence of a new Iron Curtain, and how would you describe competition globally? Um, when I mentioned bifurcation, that's exactly the kind of concept I, I was um, after. And I do think that that is um, a potentially troubling development. Um, I would not uh, welcome uh, implacably uh, opposed blocks uh, emerging in the globe. I don't suppose sort of kind of any of us um, would, and it is incumbent on us, I think, to make sure that um, w we n deal with this particular uh, uh, question, um, you know, sort of kind of properly and analyse it properly and get it, try and get ahead of it. I would say a couple of things though. Um, 1946, the information environment um, was inherently uh, much more capable of being locked down. Now, it is not the case that, um, you know, for instance, the Great Wall of China and all of the digital Great Wall of China, um, it, it is possible to lock down information, right? but it's not, it's not as easy as it was uh, then. Um, and I think that uh, modern communication technology will continue to provide over a period of time um, access to different ideas, different notions, different values, which I think we need to think uh, through because there will be there will that 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 it's not going to be an iron curtain, or if it's a, if it's any kind of curtain, it's going to be quite porous in terms of information technology. I think. Um, however. Um, we need to be quite careful that the uh, digital standards that are being uh, created on one side of that curtain, however porous it might be, um, are not the ones, merely by virtue of the fact that they are cheap, are being um, exported to some of the non allied countries which quite rightly want to advance their digital economies. And I think there is a big job of work to do to make sure that countries such as the UK, the US, but also um, you know, others in Europe and further afield are um, in a position to be able to offer a more benign information environment than otherwise the one that may sort of ultimately um, be imposed upon them. The other thing I would just say about whether or not the blocks are capable of emerging like that is that the international, international trade is vastly more interconnected now than it was in 1946. Um, I mean, by and large, it was, it, it was possible for, for a long time um, for the USSR to operate a sort of broadly closed economic 
um, system. Um, and China was clearly not the, playing the role in the international system that it plays today. Um, so it's very difficult to see um, how it would be in the economic interests of China and Russia to sort of kind of close themselves off from the rest of the world. I mean, it would, in China's case, it would, it would, it would, um, it would, it would sort of close themselves off from from the sort of engine of growth which has brought their country to where it is today. Um, so I think that's that, that's going to be very. It, it'll be much more problematic than that um, if it were to develop, and I don't think it will be complete. But I do think there are dangers in this area, as I say. I mean, uh, and standard setting in a whole host of different ways on the. As I say, on the digital and the financial services areas, I, th I think those are things to watch. So I want to end uh, uh, the way you started uh, your talk, and that is to, to come back to the Russians. Uh, it's the way you expressed a strong statement about uh, Russian activity. Uh, and I want to I see if you can outline for us and for everybody listening um, what the UK's main objectives in Ukraine are, and more broadly, from your perspective, what are the global implications of the Russian war in Ukraine of concern to the UK? Um, our um, objectives um, with respect to the uh, war in Ukraine are by and large those of the Ukrainian government. Um, Prime Minister has been very clear that he doesn't want to be more Ukrainian than, than the Ukrainians. Um, and uh, President Zelensky has been very clear what he would like um, to see uh, happen, which is the ejection of uh, uh, Russian troops from um, his uh, country. And he has not wavered in that, and he has been magnificent in his, um, in, his, um, in his belief and commitment and ability to inspire and rouse his, his, his country. Um, it is for him to uh, decide what uh, boundaries uh, uh, he's talking about there. Um, it is for him to decide whether or not there are phased approaches to uh, that. But we will continue, as the UK, to stay the course and continue to give him both material and moral um, uh, support. And um, we will work with friends in Europe and around the world and America to um, encourage everybody else to do um, the to do the same. Um, I've mentioned some of the broader uh, consequences uh, of it. Um, it's a it's a very 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 sharply defined um, example of um, what can go wrong when um, the uh, norms of um, sovereignty and territorial integrity and um, uh, uh, by, by and large um, uh, an approach to international affairs which prioritizes dialogue, understanding and access goes wrong. Um, as I said, I've mentioned Russia, China. I've mentioned the other things, but I, I do think that this is a 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 very sharp fracture, where the integrated review was identifying cracks, um, and we need to we need to sort of kind of address it in that context. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for your interest in pushing for uh, strategic stability. Thanks for the push on. Um, deterrence and, and non-proliferation. Uh, thanks for visiting with us at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, we have ranged our conversation from Herman Kahn to Huntington to uh, Tom Schelling. So uh, uh, I have marveled at your uh, w willingness to, to span both the uh, academic down to the very practical policy oriented. So uh, thanks for coming to CSIS. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed.